Um, well, welcome. Uh, my name is Jack Davidson. I'm the co-executive director of the Cyber In Innovation and Society Initiative. Um, and again, welcome to this uh, distinguished speaker series. We're continuing this from uh, last year. Um, this speak. Uh, uh, lecture is also being sponsored by the National Security Policy Center. Um, Phil Potter here is the director of that, and he's uh, going to kind of direct our conversation with the Admiral. Uh, a quick word about the Cyber Innovation and Society Initiative. Uh, this is an effort funded through the Vice President uh, for Research's office, and the mission of the Cyber uh, Innovation Society Initiative is to study these complex uh, societal um, technology and policy problems that we're facing today um, and try to make sure these technologies work for the benefit of humankind fairly, e equitably, and you know, beneficially. Sorry, beneficially. Um, and uh, we currently have several projects we're pursuing. We're looking at the uh, uh, voter registration registration system of the United States, because that's uh, an area that, as we've seen, is kind of fraught for abuse. Uh, we're also looking at crisis management um, and how to deal with those and how to bring technology to bear to deal with those. And then we're also looking at secure and efficient uh, energy production. Uh, so if you're interested in any of those projects, please you know go to our website or contact us. Um, um, so without further ado, let me introduce our, our guest. Um, uh, Admiral Mike Rogers is um, the retired from the US Navy uh, in 2018 after 37 years of active service. Um, he culminated his career uh, as uh, head of the US uh, Cyber Command and uh, uh, director of the National Security Agency. Um, in those roles, he um, worked with the leadership of the U.S. government, um, his international co counterparts, to, c to conduct cyber uh, and intelligence activities across the globe. Uh, he also assisted with the development of national and international policy with respect to cyber intelligence and technology, including extensive work with corporate leadership in finance, information technology, telecommunications and te other technology se sectors. Currently, he's a senior fellow and adjunct professor at Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. Uh, he's also a member of the United States Naval Institute Board of Directors and works with the National Defense University in the mentoring and professional development of DOD flag and general officers. Uh, so with that, please welcome Admiral Rogers. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks. Admiral Rogers, first of all, thank you so much for choosing to spend the day with us. We, thank you. We appreciate your time. We realize it's a, as it's we a beautiful about, day in Charlottesville. Exactly. And we've kept you indoors for all of it. So we appreciate that. <laughs> um, so let me jump right into it. The way we want to do this is I'm, I'm going to ask a few questions to get the conversation wow. started. And then we'll open the floor uh, and take some questions from the audience. Uh, we have about an hour. Um, so to get to the meat of the thing, you showed up at the NSA, right? Uh, very shortly thereafter, issues emerged uh, that, that kind of landed right on your lap at the nexus of issues of privacy uh, and mm -hmm. intelligence. Can you sort of help us uh, understand the reality versus the rhetoric in that situation from, from your point of view? So um, the reality to me was NSA does not, does not, and never did engage in indiscriminate surveillance of U.S. citizens. Folks, that's not what we do. Um, we were a foreign intelligence and are a foreign intelligence organization that engages in surveillance in the service of our nation outside the United States. In the context and in the execution of those duties, we acknowledge we are going to encounter U.S. persons. And so the question got to be, so what are you doing to ensure that as you're encountering U.S. persons, it's the way the global telecommunications infrastructure is built, as you're encountering U.S. persons, what are you doing to ensure that that information is appropriately protected? How, what are you doing to ensure who can access that information, for what purpose? 
How long do you retain that information? What's the criteria you use? And are you adhering to the legal framework and the checks and balances that have put in, been put in place to make sure that we or any other intelligence entity, to be honest, can just act either independently or indiscriminately? Um, I, I was hearkened to see that in the aftermath of the theft of information for the National Security Agency, the independent reviews that were mandated by the then President of the United States, President Obama, all the reviews came to the same conclusion. NSA is fully compliant with the law. NSA is an extensive regime put in place to ensure control of data associated with US persons. And NSA has an amazing culture within its workforce about the importance of protecting that information. Um, and so, you know, part of my challenge was, how do you communicate to the citizens that you serve, what it is you're doing, why, and why they should feel a measure of confidence that what you're doing is within this legal framework and you're not abusing the authorities, the technologies, the capabilities that have been granted to you, that in many cases, US citizens, your tax dollars, you provide us the resources that enable us to execute our mission. At the same time, I thought another challenge was, quite frankly, I'm trying to help a workforce that was scratching its head going, we, we didn't do anything wrong. We didn't do anything illegal. We didn't do anything that the reviews have had issues with. And yet, in this world we're living in, suddenly we're the bad guy. That, that was challenging for the workforce who truly didn't understand why. Why is it that suddenly we who are self-image is, we are serving the nation, we're doing something that ensures the safety of our citizens and our friends and allies, and yet we're being painted as this, you're a bunch of indiscriminate actors who are acting with callous disregard for the rights. In, in many instances, uh, I'm not telling everyone outside the organization believe that, but the narrative at times they would hear was, you're not professional, you don't follow the law, you don't adhere to the, the things that your leadership talks about. Um, so those are my two challenges, I thought, initially. And at the same time, I reminded the team, look, we can never lose focus on why we're here. We are here to generate insight that helps make, makes our nation more secure, that helps our policymakers make smarter and better decisions in the name of our citizens, and that helps our military commanders make smarter operational choices. Guys, men and women, no matter what else happens, we cannot forget that. That's why we're here, that's what we gotta focus on. I'll deal with the outside world. What I need you to do is focus on generating those insights. And remember that when we're generating those insights, we never, never, ever violate the law. Because in the end, if we lose the trust of the citizens we're served, we have no future as an organization, nor should we. Um, as I used to tell some of my overseas counterparts, so welcome to the world of trying to do intelligence in a democratic society in the digital age of the 21st century. This is not for the weak or faint of heart. It takes a lot of thought about what is the role of government? What is the role of an intelligence organization? What should we be comfortable with? Those aren't easy questions, but I always felt very good about what we did, how we did it, and why we did it. Can I ask you to speculate a little bit on those questions? So moving from sort of the past mm -hmm. to what the future should look like as somebody who's worked actively in this space. In a democratic society, there is, or at least in moments, there are trade-offs between privacy and security, right? It, it, you know, General Hayden likes to give a talk sort of balancing those two things. Um, how do you think about that trade-off, right? Where, do we, where is that balance as somebody who has sort of been in the trenches from the security side of things, but also thinks deeply about these issues? In terms so of for me, government? I thought making this a choice between one or the other was a false choice, Okay. number one. Number two, I always believed this well before I ever became the director of the National Security Agency. Um, I can remember having a discussion, I was in 06 with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and I said to him, because he had hired me to be his strategic thinker, a man I am, great respect for her. Uh, he was getting ready to go over to the White House for a policy discussion, and I remember having, uh, he said, any, any thoughts for me, Mike? And I said, sir, I, you're the one sitting in the chair, you're the one giving the president all this military advice. I, I would only give you one thought. Remember, in the end, if we become something we're not, if we sacrifice who we are, if we're willing to walk away from the fundamental principles that had guided us as a nation for 242 years, they've won. 
And I don't want to be something else that we aren't in the name of our security or in the name of defeating an opponent or an adversary. I want to defeat them because of who we are, what we believe, what our values are. I believe that's where our strength is. I don't want to become like them. I don't want to be an authoritarian state, for example. I don't want a security structure or an intelligence structure or a law enforcement structure that has unilateral powers. I never wanted that. I never asked for that. I never thought that was appropriate. On the other hand, I do acknowledge there will always be a creative tension in a democratic society between what's the role of government, its law enforcement, its military, its security apparatus, its intelligence structure, and what's the role and the rights of an individual. There will always be, and there always has been in our nation. Um, but in the end, if we're gonna err, I'd rather err on the fundamentals, which is the, always the rights of the citizen. I'd rather err on that. So I was one who always argued, don't make this, this it's one or the other. Um, the, the other thing is, I think one of the lessons of the last few years is, we as intelligence professionals and as a government need to be willing to have a, a broad public discussion about what it is that we do. So for example, if you take a look at um, the call data records, which were the single biggest issue uh, that initially generated all this concern, this was a law that in fact had been passed, had been passed and then updated at least once by the Congress. Except the way we chose to do this was we never informed the citizens of the nation that we serve that we had created this legal framework. Um, one of the takeaways for me is, in a democratic society, there is great value in ensuring and being open with the citizens about, hey, look, this is the legal framework we've created. This is what we're doing. Broadly, this is how we're doing it. My challenge always was the not what we're doing, it was how we're doing it. I always felt very comfortable talking broadly about what we're doing. The challenge for me as an intelligence professional was, if we get deeply into the how, it starts to compromise our ability. And quite frankly, when we start to have large public discussions of those that are then placed in media and promulgated around the world, now the very enemies that are attempting to undermine us, now they have awareness and they are gonna change the way they do things. And my ability to generate insight and knowledge as to what they're doing now becomes more difficult. So it was always the how I thought was the biggest challenge in some ways in terms of how, what you, how you talk about that in, in a public discourse. So let me change gears slightly and, and talk about cyber tools as a, as a non-kinetic response. Right? So increasingly, it seems clear reading the news that uh, we're turning to cyber tools as a response to provocative actions by other actors. Right? And I have to imagine uh, that I'm I would argue the whole world is turning right, towards exactly. cyber. And that's sort of my point. And so you know, I, I have to imagine there have been moments where you've been in the Oval Office and uh, somebody has said to you, <clears throat> Admiral Rogers, either, you know, make them stop or hurt them in some way in response. Can we make but them go dark, use Mike? This, or? Use this tool, right? And so, uh, you know, we know there are a lot of problems with it as a sort of a gray space tactic, it, it, calling it up on demand. There, there are a bunch of aspects of this tool that are challenging both for the mm -hmm. operator and for the theorist who kind of thinks about it. So I'm, I'm curious how you think about uh, cyber weapons, and I almost am reluctant to use the term weapon, but cyber tools as a non-kinetic uh, thing in the kit for dealing with these sorts of situations. What are your considerations? So cyber in the form, remember, we're talking about, in essence, a software program that is written to achieve a specific impact or effect on a specific network and its specific configuration. That effect might be to degrade something. It might be to deny opponents the ability to use something. It might be outright destruction of that, that network or that infrastructure. It might be degraded, slow it down, make it, make it more difficult for a user to use. Um, there's all sorts of things, but broadly, when it comes to the application of cyber as a weapon, it has both great potential and it also has limitations. In terms of limitations, I would remind policymakers, remember, this weapon is a software program that we wrote to use it against a specific network configuration to achieve a very specific effect. So unlike my conventional counterparts who use Tomahawk cruise missiles, who use JDAMs, that's a kind of munition you drop from an aircraft, 
In the kinetic world, we use the same munitions over and over again. We've been dropping the same weapons, same type of weapon, not clearly the same weapon, but we've been dropping or employing the same ordnance for years, in some cases decades. I reminded all my policy counterparts and my bosses, cyber's not like that. Every single weapon we custom develop, we custom write to a specific configuration for a specific target to achieve a specific effect. So unlike conventional weapons, where we literally have tens of thousands of precision conventional weapons sitting in magazines around the world, cyber is not like that. It, it doesn't work. It doesn't scale like that. So one of the first things I always highlighted was cyber doesn't scale in the same way. So you need to think of cyber as something very precise, very specific. Um, you know, not something, well, it's just going to knock everything out. You know, that, that, that really doesn't help me. We need to be very specific here. Um, however, the other thing I always thought was very important, and the DOD always worked very hard on this, my argument, as well as others, was we should use the same legal framework and the same broad frame of reference for the application of non-kinetic or cyber force that we do with kinetic force, whether that be in a software program that we've written or a Tomahawk cruise missile that we're firing off a submarine or a ship or a, a, a precision guided bomb that we're dropping off an unmanned vehicle or off an aircraft. We should use the same thought process. So we always want to be proportional. What we're doing should be a proportional response to something that's happened before us or proportional to the situation. It should be very specific. It's not something that you do indiscriminately. You, you, you select a specific target for a specific purpose. Um, which I always thought was interesting, you know, looking at not Petya, for example. So June of 2017, probably the greatest cyber incident we've had globally, not Petya, which is the name given to a malware written by the Russians that they employ in Ukraine, designed to achieve effect against infrastructure as well as organizations in the Ukraine, suddenly proliferates on a global basis. And now we're seeing degradation and impact in businesses, in government structures like the National Health Service in the United, Service in the United Kingdom uh, on a global basis. I'm looking at that and going, wow, had that been something we had ever done, that, that would have never been acceptable for us. It, it would have been, Mike, you gotta be very precise here. Which is one thing that I feel very good about in the application of cyber force to date in every operation I was ever part of and in continuing, we have been very precise you have not seen significant second and third order effect. You have not seen it reverberate in other areas when we talk about cyber command in this case. Uh, uh, that's something I was always very proud of. I always thought was very important. We've got to be very precise in what we're doing, team. We can't do something indiscriminately um, because, again, it doesn't, it's not how we use capability. So if cyber scales differently, right, and it should be governed by principles of proportionality, mm -hmm. and it is precise. Is it possible to achieve deterrence in this space? What does deterrence look like? How do we stop, how do we convince? So we clearly as a world are working, still yeah. working our way through. What are the ideas of deterrence? Now, traditionally, if you take a look at it, I'm not arguing that it automatically translates, but if you look at deterrence in the nuclear arena, for example, where we probably have the most developed thought over decades, literally, if you go back and read it, for example, that nobody remembers Henry Kissinger's initial writings go back to the 1950s and early 60s when he's at Harvard. He, he's writing on nuclear deterrence theory. Um, the, the two broad principles of nuclear deterrence, deterrence were you deter by two ways. You either convince the adversary that despite their best efforts, they won't be successful, or two, you convince the adversary, even if you were to be successful, the price you will pay is so high, it will outweigh any gain that you might get from being successful. It doesn't automatically translate to cyber. For example, I used to argue we need to make it harder, but my ability, or I would argue anyone's ability to guarantee with 100% certainty that an opponent will never be successful in cyber, low probability of being able to say that. I'm not a, that that's just unrealistic. So the idea that we're going to deter by ensuring that no one could be successful, I don't think that translates well in the cyber arena. Um, the idea of deterrence in terms of price, I, I think that component arguably potentially translates well into the cyber arena. The other part that's insightful about the nuclear piece, and why I don't think it necessarily is a great example, 
Remember, the nuclear peace starts with initially only one nation in the world having the capability. Over time, the capability morphs to a greater number of nations, but it's still in the big scheme of things, it's a handful of nations, number two. And number three, the capability to date has only been within the nation state. We have had no non-state actors to date be able to develop nuclear capability, let alone employ it. Cyber doesn't work that way at all. This is not something that just nations, that just one nation state developed. It's not something that just a handful of nation states control the access to. And it's not something that non-state actors have nothing to do with. So it doesn't, the, the analogies often just don't translate well. So the challenge I think is, the last part I would add, deterrence was also predicated in the idea that the actor you're trying to deter had a level of awareness of what your capabilities are. And number two, most importantly, believed that you were prepared to use those capabilities. In the cyber world, I would argue yet, there's not yet a full broad understanding of just what is the range of capabilities of, available to the United States or other actors. And then secondly, are, are, is, it, is an adversary confident that we would be prepared to use those capabilities in the way that we've been very explicit. If you use nuclear weapons, we are prepared to employ them. We hope we never have to, but there shouldn't be any doubt of any nation in the world. We have them for a reason, and we are prepared to use them if we must, even though it is our preference never to have to use them. Um, we're not in the same place in cyber. So we're gonna have to work our way through it, but it's one of the reasons why, for example, when we, uh, we publicly acknowledged, probably about three years ago now, I guess, that we were using cyber as a tool against ISIS. One of the reasons I argued with the secretary was, sir, we can use this as a vehicle to help inform other actors out there. We have capability, we're prepared to use that capability. We should think more broadly than just ISIS. This is an opportunity for us to try to inform and message a much broader set of actors out there other than just ISIS. Interesting. Um, so uh, I know a fair number of people in this room, there's quite a few sort of aspiring security professionals here. Um, I'm still an aspiring security professional go. myself <laughs> after 37 years. <laughs> so you never make it in the end. Um, the uh, question I have for you is, you know, what do you see on the horizon? What are, what are these folks gonna be grappling with? What do you think they should be thinking about? How should they be training up? Uh, in order to be prepared for, you know, the world a decade out, two decades Jack, out. So I would argue um, over the last, you know, in the post 9-11 environment in many ways, the non-state actor tended to be the focus, tended to be the biggest shaper of U.S. strategy, U.S. focus, U.S. attention, strategies, the way we were spending resources and employing resources. I would argue that has uh, changed that as I look out over the next 10, 20 years, I would argue the state actor is gonna be the, the, the greatest impactor of national security and strategy for us. It's gonna be the biggest challenge. I would also argue the greatest long-term challenge for us from a national security perspective, I would argue is gonna be climate change over the course of the coming decades. It's not something that's gonna to happen tomorrow, it's not something that's gonna happen um, in a particular administration, but I would argue you can see the challenges already as water rises, as infrastructure around coastal nations, as we're gonna have mass exodus of people, as it becomes more difficult to grow crops in some areas, as massive amounts of people are displaced because they can't get access to water, they can't get access to food because temperature is rising. Those are all gonna be challenges for us as remotely settled locations like islands, and there's a former Pacific individual, you know, re remotely settled islands in the Pacific that are gonna be underwater. Infrastructure in the United States, you look at all, the, all those beautiful large superstructures, skyscrapers built along the waters of the United States, that's gonna be a challenge in the coming decades for us. Um, and this is something that it doesn't care how wealthy your country is, it doesn't care how large or small your country is. It just cares about things. Where are you from a hemispheric challenge? Because that'll help drive temperature. How much water do you have? How close to the coast are you? Those are all going to be somewhat agnostic figures. So I would argue there's a lot of national security implications for climate change, and we're going to need to work our way through this. Um, and it's going to take a long-term commitment. 
Um, at the same time, I would also argue in the more immediate near term, we've got an interesting disconnect or dichotomy going on right now. Technology is, go is driving us to a much more globalized, interconnected world. And yet, politically, in some areas, we're being driven to a much more fragmented world. You look in some ways at some of the things China is doing. You look at the Russians and others. In some ways, from a political standpoint, we're moving less away from an integrated to a, a much more disparate world. So technology is driving us in one direction. Political dynamics are driving us in another. It will be interesting to see how those play out over the course of the next two, five, 10 years, which model is gonna become reality versus, versus which one is, hey, intellectually it was great, but that's not the way it all worked out. Um, we'll have to see how that unfolds. So while you, you may still be aspiring, you've led some large organizations in your time. Um, what are the lessons you've learned? What does sort of leadership look like in, the, in this present environment? Um, leadership can be lonely. I used to tell everybody, if your metric is to be popular, then get out of the job. Because that's not why we are where we are. We get paid to use our experience, our perspective, our expertise, partnered with the insights of others to try to make hard decisions that generate better mission outcomes for the, for the nation we serve. And sometimes that's gonna lead you to make decisions that aren't necessarily popular. But that's what you have to do. My, my second takeaway is, as important as mission is, don't ever forget that you can't execute the mission without motivated, well-trained, well-led men and women. So for all the time you spend on the mission, for all the time you spend on technology, you ought to be spending an equal amount of time on those men and women, because that's what really gives you your advantage. It's not the technology. You know, put another way, I used to tell Congress in the White House, Look, if, if everything fell apart, if you gave us enough money, I could replace the infrastructure in some small number of years. If we lost this workforce, it would take us decades to rebuild the expertise. We can't afford to lose these men and women. So we have to ask ourselves, what do we need to do to continue to be relevant to them as they are making tough choices about what do they want out of life? What do they want to build for themselves? What's the future they want to create? What kind of organizations do they want to be a part of? Um, I always felt good that we could present an attractive case to the men and women of the United States. Um, and I still do. I always thought, hey, look, we got a great mission. We have an incredible group of men and women already on the team. We serve something greater than ourselves, and we get to do some really cool stuff that literally you can't legally do anywhere else. Those are all great things, I thought, in trying to build a team. Um, and those remain there. But you can't just assume that, well, of course people are gonna wanna work with us. We're the government, we're here to, we're the good guys. We serve the citizens. I'm like, mm, I don't think that's enough in, in the world that, that we're living in. I'd also argue, um, it, one of my takeaways is change is never easy. Um, I, I led NSA through its largest series of changes in over 20 years. I, I felt that the thing I told everybody was, look, we haven't done something like this in almost 20 years. If we were a business and we had never made any significant changes, do you think we'd still be leading in market share? I don't think so. I see the world around us changing from a technical standpoint. I see the expectations of the citizens that we serve are evolving and changing. We got to evolve and change with this. We just can't keep doing the same thing the same way and expect to sustain the level of success that we have enjoyed because we did enjoy and continue to significant success in our ability to generate insights to help serve the nation. That was always the best part of the job, that and the men and women. Very good, thank you. Let me open it up um, and, and hear a bit from you. Uh, yeah, right there. I tell you what, could you stand up? Could you identify yourself and then let everybody hear the question if you could? No, right that's good, that's good. Yeah. And we'll probably repeat the question for you. So no, they got a microphone. Oh, there's a mic, wonderful. Sweet. Uh, my name is Zaki, I'm a student in the Physics and Mathematics Department at the University of Virginia. I want to ask about a remark you made saying that we need a broader public discussion on the subject of the roles and responsibilities of the NSA. 
But something that I think you failed to recognize explicitly is that the only reason why we are having this discussion is because a whistleblower who you have condescended to during this presentation without even mentioning his name revealed certain internal proceedings of the NSA that the public wasn't aware of and that we only found out later had an illegitimate interpretation of the Patriot Act as its justification. So my question to you is how do we reconcile this statesmanlike love for democracy with neglecting to look for the consent of the government? So I would fundamentally disagree with you. You're entitled to your opinion, don't get me wrong, that's the powerful thing about the society we live in. Um, I would disagree with characterization of whistleblower. There's in fact a very specific legal definition to what a, a whistleblower is. I don't think that criteria was ever met, so I fundamentally reject that premise. Um, look, what I always told the workforce was, if you see anything that you believe to be illegal, immoral, or unethical, I expect you to stand up and say something about it. Because that's what professionals do. I also remind you, look, we've got a mechanism to address that, and I expect you to use the mechanism. And the answer isn't to decide, I'm the judge and the jury, and I'll decide what's right, and I'm just going to remove information and then indiscriminately give it to others. I said, guys, that is not the way to do things. Be leery of living in a society in which everyone can decide what laws they like and what laws they don't like. I would argue that's not in a society's long term best interest. So you're certainly entitled to your opinion, but it's, it's one that I don't accept personally. You did in the form of, in a representative democracy, the individuals that you as a citizen elected to represent your interests created a legal framework. You can certainly disagree with it, but my comment would be, remember, guys, we're living in a, in a representative democracy. You may not like it, but it's the way it works. So again, my comment would be arguing that, well, this isn't something that was agreed to. I'm like, look, you can certainly disagree with it, but this used a legal framework that was within the laws of the citizens and, the, and this nation. So I, again, I don't agree with the characterization. Kevin's gonna get his exercise today. First of all, thank you for coming out. And a written also, question. This will be a good one. This will be, <laughs> this will be a good I one. I wrote it down. So <clears throat> I guess this is a, uh, a question I have about how the intelligence organizations go about making certain decisions about things they should do or opportunities they should pre present. So in the intelligence community, uh, we look at intelligence issues often from the perspective of how can the U.S. benefit from this opportunity or how can we present an opportunity to policymakers or decision makers about the what's best for the U.S. in this situation, but do we also weigh the morality of those decisions and the impacts of those decisions upon the people that it would affect? I won't speak for anybody else. I'll speak for myself. I sure do. I never would do anything that I believed was illegal, immoral, or unethical. Mm -hmm. That's the oath I took 37 years ago. And every decision I ever made, whether it was that when I was the director or I was much more junior, I never forgot the context that I was operating in, or the fundamental principles that I care about as a citizen. And so, and just I guess personally, because those principles, like could you elaborate on what some of those things are, like, or some of the things that uh, you, you fundamentally believe in, just out of curiosity, like uh, the, the things of the Constitution or things around that, I'm just wondering. So I'm confused, I apologize, I don't understand the question. Sorry, I guess, when you're saying um, the fundamental principle, principles you believe in, uh, could you elaborate on what some of those are? I'm just so, curious. So the first principle is always the loss. So that's an easy one. You always turn to your general counsel and you always say, okay, so is there anything you're hearing here that you have concerns about the legality of? The second thing, and this is a, a discussion I would often have, not just in, in my last two jobs, but throughout the course of my career, I said, remember, it's important to have a discussion about what can we do, but it's also to make sure what should we do is an important part of this, that the two aren't synonymous. Mm -hmm. And so I always try to ensure that as we, within the teams that I've ever been a part of, that I've ever led, I always try to make sure that the discussion involved not just what can we do, but what should we do. And in several instances, I'm not gonna go to details, I, I, I can remember at least two where I just said, I got it, it's legal, I got it, we could do it. I don't think this really meets the spirit here. We're, we're not gonna go down this road. Thank you.
hand that. It's a hot mic. <laughs> hey, so thank you again for coming out. Um, one sure. thing I'm kind of curious your opinion on is 5G is becoming more of a reality in these in the world, with especially companies like Huawei setting up their infrastructure. What do you kind of see the impacts for cybersecurity, whether once the 5G is implemented? And I guess also if you want to talk about Huawei, you can, but it's your, up to you. Right. So I wouldn't make this just about one company. In this case, you gave an example of Huawei in, in 5G. One of the concerns I had when I left the government was I, I thought we were not doing as good a job as we needed to on understanding the national security implications of technology. 5G, I thought, was a textbook case. So 5G is not, because I used to get this in the government, so this is like one better than 4G, right, Mike? And I would go, no, 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 no. Think about this as with 5G technology, we are going to remove latency. We, we're going to address the latency issue. We're going to increase bandwidth and speed capability. And we are going to enable handheld digital devices to be able to do things in multiple mediums, multiple formats, with massive amounts of data that right now you, you need a laptop or a mainframe to do. And we are all going to provide that in a mobile device that we can take with us anywhere in the world and use anytime. I said, though, that's pretty profound to me. There are a lot of second and third order implications in that. I believe 5G starts to become a huge building block for autonomous vehicles. If you want to use autonomous vehicles in scale and large numbers on a nation like the United States, you need a network infrastructure that you can plug into that those vehicles can use. 5G represents potentially one of the building blocks for that, as an example. So the question I always thought was, this is not about a particular company. This is about for core enabling technologies that are going to underpin your economic competitiveness as a nation in the coming years. Are you comfortable with the idea of some potential foreign entity having either access and or some measure of control or influence over that infrastructure? And the way you answer that question then shapes your views on should that company be enabled to do, be allowed to do certain things. In some areas, I thought, look, it, it's not a core technology. It doesn't have huge, massive economic impact. The risk is relatively low. I don't think this is a factor. In other areas, 5G is an example, I would argue the economic, economic impact is going to be massive. The implications in terms of that under, underpinning kind of core bed of technology we're going to create, that's going to be huge. Yes, I think we need to step back and ask ourselves, how comfortable are we with a foreign entity doing that for us? Um, I think, secondly, we need to step back and ask ourselves, how is it in one generation of a technology that, remember, telecommunications was a core US strength. All the foundational technologies associated with telecommunications were largely US invented. Not only were they invented, but the global standards that were created largely reflected um, the U.S. approach. And then we monetized those investments in the form of these major companies that commercialized the technology and generated this amazing revenue for our nation. That was the case up through the first four generations of cell technology. How in the course of three or four years did we go from being the world leader in 4G technology to in the next generation 5G, we are no longer economically competitive against a foreign entity. I would argue we need to step back, take the emotion out of this, and ask ourselves, how did that happen? Why did it happen? Are we comfortable with that? Because my argument with you would be, today it's 5G. Tomorrow it's going to be quantum. It'll be nanotechnology. You're going to see this play out over a handful, not everything, but a handful of core technologies that I think are going to be pretty key to a nation's economic competitiveness in the 21st century in the digital age. And I think we need to be, that needs to be a conscious decision by design, not just happenstance. Let me follow up on this a little bit. So do you worry about the long-term implications of government sort of directing key technologies, key segments of the economy? Obviously. You know, the underpinnings of national security and strength are economic. We became the economic powerhouse that we are through open commerce, generally not engaging in these sorts of behaviors. Um, you already mentioned several subsequent technologies that you, you say would potentially right. fit in the same framework. You know, I wonder how we sort of balance this 
push towards sort of autarkic directed production versus the type of economy that so I think underpins the, our strength. Right. I think the challenge is the world around us is changing and we need to evolve. What do I mean by that? As you've indicated, traditionally the US model always was keep the government out of technology with the private sector, let the private sector play to its strengths, which is innovation, the ability to outthink, to out-innovate, to outperform its competition, and that that will win the day. Will produce the best technology the best pr at the best price point, or at least an acceptable price, acceptable price point, and will win the market. That worked, I thought, um, for much of the last 75 years. But here's what's changed to me: that works when the playing field is level, and the competition is another company. You tell me how that model works when the playing field isn't level and the competition is not a single company. Instead, it's an integrated national strategy where the company is only one part of a broader national effort that includes combining their espionage capability and stealing information and then sharing it with that company, which involves harnessing the power of a state's national laboratory and academic research, which involves harnessing the capabilities of a, of a nation state's educational institutions, then it becomes much more difficult to me. So you tell me how an individual US private company is supposed to compete against that model. That becomes really tough. And that is what Huawei represents to me. It's a totally different model. It's a different approach. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but it's different. And it, that is how they've been able to go. We were the leaders and now in that one technology, in some ways they're not. And I think the implication for us is to step back and say, so are we comfortable with this model? Or do we need to evolve it? Now, I don't think the answer is to evolve it to a point where the nation state, in this case, we in a, in a democratic society say, so we're gonna control and drive everything. We're not going back to the Apollo era. As, as impressive as that was, as much pride as some of us have in what we're able to accomplish, during that time frame, that's not a model that's going to work today. But I do believe that the model needs to evolve to a much more integrated government and private sector partnership. This idea that these actors can all act alone, whether it be the government or the private sector, I don't think that's a model for success for us. trying to keep it so it can wander its way We're back. We're moving the microphone yeah. by hand. <laughs> Hi, so going off of that, actually, I believe you've talked before about- So tell me your name if you would. Sorry, my name's Campbell. I'm a student in the Batten School. I work for the National oh, Security Policy Center. Um, I believe you talked before about data manipulation versus mm -hmm. data theft, and I was wondering kind of what you think the implications of that will be going forward, what that might look like, and you know, how can the US protect against that and how the private sector might play a role in that as well? So to date, most, most activity has involved theft of data, whether it's nation states penetrating systems for the theft of intellectual property that they believe will gain them some advantage, whether it's criminal entities penetrating um, uh, hotel reservation systems, et cetera, to steal uh, you know, information on your credit card, your date of birth, your social security number, your um, credit card information. The two trends that I, that I think about is, okay, what happens if the focus evolves to data destruction? Or perhaps most challengingly, what if it's data manipulation? What if you make minor changes in data elements that are hard to identify, understand, and recognize, but have significant second and third order implications on how the data is used? I wonder, boy, what does that mean? Particularly as you're looking at, and you have to do this at scale, so I don't want to overhype this, but as you look at artificial intelligence, it'll be shaped simplistically by the algorithms you develop that enable it to learn and the data you feed it. If you manipulate the data or you manipulate the algorithms, the, I don't know, I wonder this, if you manip manipulate the data or you manipulate the algorithms, can you manipulate the learning? Can you shape learning and drive it in a direction? I don't know, but I, I ask myself, hmm, is it possible for an adversary to do something like this? Um, 
that's kind of what I, what I tend to, to worry about as I'm thinking about data, so to speak. You guys are the quietest yeah. audience I have ever had. Well, congratulations on your discipline. Your discipline is incredibly high. Hi, thank you for speaking to us. My name is Rose Kelly. I'm an undergrad here. Would you respond to the reversal of Presidential Policy Directive 20 and its implications on, um, um, on accountability, oversight, and appropriate cyber response? So a presidential policy decision 20, and I apologize, I don't remember the, although I, yeah, I spent so much time on it, but I don't remember the exact title, was the, the policy put in place, it was written during the Obama administration, to govern simplistic, if you will, um, oversight of government cyber activities broadly, um, particularly for non-espionage purposes. And so PPD 20 was the framework we always would use as we were making a decision about what Cyber Command and other organizations could or couldn't do within cyber. When the Trump administration came in, the decision was made to um, do away with PPD, PPD 20 and create a different framework. I was supportive of that. I argued, look, PPD 20 reflects a time and a place. Our knowledge, our comfort with cyber is evolving and the, the processes we use got to change with it. I found it to be very restrictive, almost a paralyzing document sometimes. Not all the time, sometimes. Um, therefore, I and others argued we need a different framework that governs how we do this. Now, the things that were important, I said, is number one, we should not grant unilateral authority here. That's not what, I, I never felt that that's what we needed to do. I always thought that it was important, no matter what I did in the DOD as the operational commander for cyber, so to speak, that everything I did was coordinated with others, that, that I wasn't acting as a lone actor and that we were making a conscious decision about what are the trade-offs associated with a particular event or activity. I also felt, on the other hand, look, in many areas kinetically, when the Trump administration came in, they felt comfortable, they reassessed and said, look, there's some areas of risk we're willing to push down to cabinet level, to like the Secretary of Defense. I, I would argue we should do the same thing in the cyber arena, not for everything, but we ought to have a discussion about what areas are we willing to push down to a cabinet level authority. Um, and that's really what we did in the after, as we replaced PPD 20. And, and I apologize, I, it doesn't have the, the catchy slang to it. I'm trying to remember what the, the new acronym, acronym is, and I'm just failing, I apologize. In the back. Oh, sorry, there's a mic there, and you, you're next, I promise. Right. <laughs> Damn it, they're silencing the audience. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm a recently retired Beltway Bandit, Larry Fox. Thank you uh, for your service. Oh, thank you, sir. And uh, for your fact-based service. Quick question about quantum computing mm -hmm. and how that is going to affect C4 ISR and how. Would you well believe me if I told you it was a flash in the pan and not to worry about it? I'm, I don't believe you. <laughs> That's good. That is the wrong call. <laughs> so, um, quantum refers to a, a computational capability that is transitioning from the th from the from the theoretical to the practical. Right now, there is a level of capability in quantum that enables quantum technology at small levels to work some problem sets already. The power potentially of quantum is its ability to uniquely process multiple variables simultaneously. So you go away from a binary, one or zero, to multiple variables simultaneously with massive amounts of data that helps you address really complex problems with lots of variables like weather, like cancer in the human gene, um, like encryption, for example, where you get multiple variables and massive amounts of data. So the projection is sometime over the course of the next 10 to 15 years, you're likely to see computational capability in the form of quantum that enables you to address some of those really complex, multiple variable, massive data kinds of questions. Like anything, like most things, it will offer both great opportunity and great challenge. And so we gotta work our way through this. We both have to be able to think about how we're gonna use it, but by the same token, we also need to think about how do we defend against its potential misuse or use against. Um, 
Uh, it's going to happen. So anybody who thinks the answer is, well, don't worry about it. We just won't develop the technology. I'm like, that isn't going to be the way this is going to go. And quantum will do some amazing things. I mean, it is true. If you love engineering, if you love technology, it is cool technology. I mean, it is some really interesting, you know, how do you get these un unstable elements to hold together to work and to do it in numbers that generate these massive levels of heat, for example? And, and how do you spin that all off and still generate enough stability that you can address the computational challenges? As a technical engineer kind of guy, I really I enjoy that problem set. I enjoy that challenge, even as I acknowledge this is potentially game-changing technology. So you've already seen it today in some forms, but it'll really take off. You know, right now you can get qubits, which are the fundamental building blocks, 5, 10, 20, 100. Um, but to get where we need to go, you're looking at configurations. Can you keep qubits stable at a million? You know, those are the kinds of things we're going to have to work our way through. In the back, as promised. All right. Oh, we didn't get you the microphone. <laughs> we still didn't get you the microphone. I wouldn't frame it in a security versus openness, but I would acknowledge, look, in the world we're living in, I think technology is always going to outstrip policy and the legal framework. I would argue encryption is, the, is, the, is a, a poster child for that challenge, where the ability to defend or protect information has outstripped the legal authority that we traditionally have had to access that information. Um, and so I think it's important that we as a society have a discussion. Are we comfortable with that idea? Historically, and I can remember hearing this from a president who was a constitutional lawyer, historically in our legal framework, no data, no information have been beyond the reach of a court. And yet technology is placing us in a situation where right now from a technical perspective, data is outside potentially the reach of a legal framework. And so I just think we need to have a conversation as a society. Is Are we comfortable with that? Maybe the answer is yes. But I want it to be a conscious decision and not something because of a group of really smart people got ahead of the law. Not that, not that that was their intent. I don't mean to imply that for one minute. But it's just the reality of where we are. Ma'am. It's coming. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, those outside of the security community or those who are involved with the academy or the universities at large, we are at UVA right now. Uh, how can we as academics and future scholars protect the integrity of national security in the United States? So I think part of the challenge is you have to acknowledge that the ag academic environment is becoming a target. That external actors are interested in the research that you're doing. They're interested in some of the business relationships as universities look to generate revenue as they look to commercialize research, as they create new partnerships. I'm not arguing that's good or bad. That's not what I mean. Um, but I think it starts from a premise you have to acknowledge that makes you a target in a way that historically you might not have been. So you need to think through, so what are the implications for that? What kind of security standards do we need? What kind of structures do we need? What kind of controls do we need to put in place? In some areas, I would argue, look, the risk is low. You don't need to do any of that. In other areas, I would argue, Boy, there's some national security implications here. You need to have a discussion about that, and we need to think about what works in one area won't work in another. I, don't, I would urge everybody, look, it's not a one-size-fits-all world. I, I'd urge us to think a little bit more deeply. Uh, one last question. Uh, the mic's near you. We're going to take advantage of it. Hi, my name is Anand. I am a fourth year economics student. And um, my question sort of revolves around this rank that you hold, Admiral. And when I think Admiral, I think 
big battleships, water, and stuff like that. So I'm curious, how did your time in the Navy specifically influence you as a security leader? Um, well, I actually commanded a fleet that had no ships. So as a three-star, I was a fleet commander, and it was a fleet that had no ships. Um, you know, the, I used to use the analogy, look, the world of cyber has many of the same characteristics of the physical world. And when I started my career, I was a very traditional, I was a ship driver. I was, had a very traditional career for the first five, six years. And so I used to tell people, look, cyber has key terrain. Cyber is an area in which we conduct a variety of very traditional operations, same as I did when I was a ship driver. We do maneuver, we do fires, we do reconnaissance, we do defense, we do all. I said, look, the same things we used to do, we do in the physical world, we do them in this virtual world that man has created. So there are some similarities. Now, there are also some significant differences, but I used to argue, don't treat cyber as something so unique, so different, that the principles, the foundational tenets, the strategies, and the frame of references that we developed over time in the physical world, I said, start with that as a point of departure, and then let's figure out what's different. But let's not spend, let's not go the opposite direction. Everything in cyber is different. We're just going to highlight a few similarities. I thought, mm, that doesn't help us. Because my other concern was, if you go down that road, people who don't have familiarity with cyber are just going to start to tune out because we're going to be arguing, look, we're different, we're unique, we're special. None of that stuff applies to us. I never agreed with that, for me anyway. Admiral, thank you, thank you for your time. This has been thank fantastic. Thank you. Thank I you very much, Edward. Can I make one comment? Yeah. Let me just say a couple things before I leave. First and foremost, hey, at times we're going to disagree with each other. The only thing I ask is, look, we have got to work together to solve problems, even when we don't always agree with each other. And I cannot stand dealing with individuals who, hey, you are, you're not only wrong, you're bad. I'm like, stop. We can't get to outcomes if that's the attitude we have about each other. I respect difference. I don't think less of someone because they have a different opinion. What I want to focus on is, so how can we work together to achieve outcomes? That's point number one. And that has nothing to do with what you do, what you believe, how old you are, what you want to do in life. Secondly, uh, and finally, this nation needs motivated men and women who want to serve as part of its team in the government. I urge you to consider that as you are trying to build a future for yourself, as you are contemplating what you want to do in life. I wish you success in whatever it is you choose to do. I would only ask that you consider being part of a team in which you're part of something bigger than yourself. You're working hard to defend the citizens of the nation that you're a part of. You're going to get to work with some incredibly motivated men and women who are really good at what they do and who are fundamentally good, hardworking people. And you're going to get the chance to try to make things better. That is something that's incredibly powerful to me. And this government, the organizations I was a part of, we need motivated men and women. Okay? So thanks very much. Thanks. Hey. As a token of our appreciation for Admiral Rogers vis visiting us, I have a, uh, a uniquely, uh, in two ways that I'll tell you, uniquely uh, Virginia gift. Uh, most of you probably will recognize this. This is a Virginia cup. This was designed by Thomas Jefferson. He had candlesticks melted down to make this so that he could drink wine. I hope you like wine. You can drink wine in this. The other unique aspect of this is this is the cup. Um, I teach a hacking course called Defense Against the Dark Arts here, and the top hacker at the end of the semester in the class gets one of these cups, and as the instructor of that course, I can declare you a top hacker, Ooh. which you definitely are, and so you also get the wizard. Okay, cup. thank you. Thank you very much, thank sir. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks. Thank That's cool.